Hey there, it's Ruby Jones, and I'm back to introduce another episode of Read This, our sister podcast. Hosted by editor of The Monthly and king of the book nerds, Michael Williams, it features conversations with some of the best and most beloved writers from Australia and around the world. In this episode, we're going to hear from filmmaker, historian and writer Santilla Chingape. She's just released her first non-fiction book. It's called Black Convicts. Before we do, Michael is here to share a bit about their conversation. So, Michael, Santilla Chingabe's new book, it's this fascinating and fresh look into Australia's colonial history and it challenges some long-held preconceptions about the way that our nation was shaped. Can you tell me a bit about how the book does this? Yeah, Sandy is an extraordinary storyteller and has been working as a journalist and a filmmaker uh, for many years now. She writes regularly for both the Saturday paper and the monthly, and I'm a big fan of her work. And part of what's so exciting about this novel is in many ways it's the culmination of a whole lot of the stuff she's done before. You may have seen a few years ago on SBS a documentary that she made called Our African Roots. It won a number of awards. It was critically acclaimed. It's back up on SBS On Demand at the moment, if you want to catch it. But in it, she looks at the unrelenting whiteness of the way in which we talk about the first fleet and the first wave of kind of invasion and settlement into Australia. The point that Sandy makes is that actually amongst those convicts were a number of people of African descent. In the first fleet, at least 15 of the convicts were of African descent, and by 1840, that number had risen to about 500. So it was a significant part of our history, but one that never features in the conventional way Australian history is told, in the pictures we see, in the stories we tell. And, Michael, you're someone who's curious about the world, you read a lot, you know a lot about Australian history. So did what Santi discover, did any of it come as a surprise to you? Yeah, look, I mean, I think as a lot of our listeners would have experienced themselves, Ruby, the way in which Australian history is taught in school follows certain conventions and expectations. I think it's improved since I was at school, but, you know, my memory is it was all stories about bush rangers and Burke and Wills disappearing into the desert and a whole lot of white convicts coming over here and speaking with broad Cockney accents about how they stole some apples back in London streets. There's a kind of sepia-toned idea about Australian history. And while we've gotten perhaps a little bit better about understanding the disposition possession of First Nations people in this country. Um, We still don't understand the full implications of the British Empire, of the way in which the colonial project was built on things like slavery, uh, and that did play a part in the founding of the nation we now know as Australia. And what Sandy does is brings that to the fore again in a way that is bracing and challenging, but also incredibly enlightening. Coming up in just a moment, Santilla Chingape is rewriting history. Santilla is a natural-born storyteller, but she grew up learning stories about her life through a largely white European lens. It seemed to Santi that people like her got to read about history, but never to write about it. I'd always loved reading and writing when I was a kid, and I was obsessed with writing. I remember when my family got our first computer, my brother would always play, like, video games and, like, FIFA, and I would always write plays, and, like, that was the thing that always excited me. And I didn't really think about writing as a career. I didn't really think... But I remember being fascinated by people that told stories. And then journalism became, like, a very accessible entry point for me because I saw people that looked like me doing it. And... I was like, oh, that looks like a really interesting career. Like, I think I want to do that because I get to tell stories and I get to be curious and I get to meet people. And I remember thinking, okay, where do you go if you want to be a journalist? And, you know, growing up in the 90s, Indira and I do, she was on SBS and she had a name that most people couldn't pronounce, kind of like me. And and I was like, I think that's, that's where I want to go. I want to end up at SBS. And it was a bit of a detour because I had to classic sort of like migrant thing of studying to become a doctor and then (laughs) realising that that's not what I wanted to do. And I loved community radio. I did a lot of stuff with Sin. And then that summer, I remember having the very difficult conversation with my mum and saying, I don't, I don't think I want to do this 
medicine thing. I think I want to pursue a career in journalism. And my mom, you know, reacted any way that I think most parents would. I mean, she was worried because she was like, I don't know if you're going to make any money doing this. Also, she was also looking at it from a, you, you know, you're a black woman. I don't really know if there are any opportunities for you in the world and things like that. But you'll be unsurprised to hear Sandy made those opportunities happen. On lunch breaks from RMIT, she'd walk to Fed Square to the SBS offices and ask to do work experience. Knocked back, rebuffed, told they didn't offer such things. Eventually, through sheer bloody-mindedness and tenacity, she got them to give her an unpaid internship. An internship that led to her first full-time job as a junior radio journalist. And I remember... This one day I was assigned to do a story and I was it was an elderly couple and I'd gone to their house and they were retired and the wife had health issues and they were so excited to have visitors in their home because it's that thing of like, we don't get to talk to anyone. And this man used to be a photographer when he was younger and he'd taken photos of all of these amazing people and he starts to bring out the, the books and his wife's like making tea and bringing out the biscuits and stuff. And I remember the camera just being so irritated because he was like, you came here to ask three questions, we have to go. And I'm thinking, bless, isn't this love? Like, you know what, I just felt, it just felt so extractive, like to go in, particularly sometimes going in on the worst days of people's lives and knowing that you're, you're only asking three questions for a story that's going to be a minute and a half that most people probably won't even pay attention to. And I sort of thought, gosh, do I want to do this for the rest of my life? What I did enjoy was the time that I got to spend with people. I was like, I like this. How do I find a way of being able to spend more time with people? And at the time, as luck would have it, I was moderating a conversation with a filmmaker at a film festival. And we got off the stage and she grabs my hand and she's like, we need to talk. And she says to me, you should be making documentaries. And I was like, what? (laughs) She was like, you should be making documentaries. I was like, I've never really thought about that because I've never seen anyone that looks like me making documentaries. And that's how I started making documentaries. And then that then exposed me to the wider narrative um, storytelling. And that was when I was like, I found my groove. This is where I'm meant to be. But that thing about representation, honestly. I was going to say, twice now you've mentioned that idea when trying to work out a path for yourself of having not seen people who look like you Mm. in those roles and in the telling the story and the ways in which anywhere, but particularly acute in Australia, the idea of being a migrant voice, the idea of being a person of colour, the idea of your blackness defining and potentially limiting the opportunities that are available to you. Mm. Is that a sense that you've had right through your career, that this is an option for you, this is not, or you have to model it uh, before you can do it? I think it's both, to be honest. You know, we talk about representation a lot, and I think in a sense it's kind of lost some of that just because it's so overused as, as a term. But what I will say, when you are young, you're so impressionable and you're looking to people around you for clues about how to do this life thing. And when your options are very limited because you're not seeing people that look like you and then your family also aren't seeing people that look like you and and they're also helping to shape how you're moving through the world and the choices that you're making, what it, what tends to be available then becomes very limited and and that's even before you, you enter an industry and start to sort of kind of go, okay, I think I this is, might not be what I want to do and I might want to do something else. But even before you attempt to try, there isn't an option available, right? And I think what has helped me is I've just always been curious. I've always kind of gone, let me just try it. Let me see what's going to happen. But I also know that not everyone is necessarily motivated by that kind of instinct. And for some people, not seeing themselves in a certain industry or in a certain role already eliminates that completely and you don't try. You delivered the 2023 EW Cole lecture around the question of who gets to tell history. Yeah. And as you recount in Black Convicts and and elsewhere, for you that question about permission to be a historian is a really important one that maybe more even than journalism or documentary filmmaking or other forms of storytelling, being the kind of gatekeeper who's allowed to write and tell history was a sanctified category that you felt you had to 
find your way into. And accidentally did. <laughs> and when, when that penny dropped, I was like, oh, my gosh. Why have we, certainly as marginalised, and, and I say this, you know, not on behalf of other marginalised people. Um, but no, no, you're a spokesperson. You go, <laughs> what do they all think? Tell us, Sandy. Um, but you go through life having your narrative written on your behalf and you don't question it at all and you get to a point and I had a moment where I went, why did I believe the history that I was told in school that was written by white men and not to say that that history isn't valid but I thought that I I couldn't write history. I I just thought I couldn't write history. History was told to me. I couldn't tell history. And when I... I can't overstate how liberating that realisation was for me and it's changed how I move through the world because now I feel like I am in control of my life in a way that I did not think before, before I felt like the world was shaping my life for me. And in many ways it still does. I mean, structurally and systemically, all these things still continue to dictate the outcomes of your life. But in terms of going, oh, actually, I can determine what my life looks like to a degree because it is not being written for me, you know. And history has a way of convincing you that you are a certain thing. And particularly histories around colonisation and colonialism where certainly from the African perspective, majority of the histories that I read growing up and that I was told, it was almost as though black people were passive and they were submit and they just kind of accepted that but obviously when you think about it now it's like yeah who is just going to be like yeah take take my house <laughs> without any kind of resistance right you will get people that will fight back but that wasn't the center of the story the story was always about the people that came and what they did and the so-called good that they did and then you move through the world and having that then still being reinforced that oh you should actually be just grateful you know and you don't realize how much that subconsciously shapes how you move through the world. And so you you enter spaces not feeling like you have a sense of ownership. When you do, like this world belongs to all of us, right? And so when I had that realisation, I was like, oh, my gosh, I don't have to be in the passenger seat of the world that I want to live in. I can contribute to kind of reimagining what that looks like. And my position, my viewpoint is valid. Mm. (laughs) You know, for something like that to happen for me in my 30s, like my late 30s, I was like, gosh, it's still something that I, I still try to process about how it, it has impacted me and how I move through the world. But it really, we talk about stories and sometimes don't realize just the power of stories. And for me, the process of this really, really, really reinforced, like, words, stories, language are incredibly powerful. Mm. Like, and, and it made me realise just how important it is for those of us that are creating stories to be very aware of that power. The whole process of writing this, I was incredibly scared. I was like, here I am upending how white Australia has seen itself for a very long time and the mythologies it's told itself about itself. And it's not used to people like me telling it. We're the ones that get told, right? And that triggers emotions and feelings in people. And I was aware that the work was going to be scrutinised. And I was like, well, I don't want to give them the reason to dismiss these people's stories. And so as much as I would have liked to push some things further, I just pulled back and I went, we're going to stay with what the Colonial Archive is saying and within that try and move and try and make certain points. It was hard because of that. Like I, I, I don't ever want to write anything that limits me in that way again. When we come back, Sandy shares the inciting incident that set her on the path to writing Black Convicts and reveals how the ghosts of the archives lived with her during the writing of this book. We'll be back in a minute. 
Don't miss the 2024 Russell Hobbs British Film Festival, screening from November 6 through to December 8 at Palace Cinemas. This year's festival boasts a selection of tender dramas, action-packed thrillers, comedy, documentaries and retrospectives, starring some of Britain's most well-known faces, including Saoirse Ronan, Andrew Garfield, Florence Pugh, Ray Fiennes and Jude Law. Head over to britishfilmfestival.com.au to book your tickets now. Cheerio! While the idea of black convicts had been percolating in Santilla Chingape's mind for many years, it was during the summer of 2018 that things shifted into focus. You might remember it was January of that year and Peter Dutton, who was Minister of Home Affairs at the time, announced that Victorians were scared to go out to restaurants because of African gang violence. It was idiotic and transparently racist, uh, this attempt to scare white Australians into demonising their neighbours. And it scared Santi too, but for very different reasons. I remember I was overseas at the time and I got a call to be on a panel to discuss that incident because at that, at that point I'd been writing about those narratives and how the media was also complicit in essentially perpetuating racist narratives because, you know, he's saying that people of African descent are predisposed to commit crime because of the colour of their skin is racist. <laughs> and, yeah, I, and I remember thinking, I've been talking about this and nothing's changing. It's not, it's not cutting through and I don't know what it was. And then I remember returning and just feeling so, and I, I said, I, I, I can't, I'm, I don't want to be part of this panel. But I remember being very frustrated about it. And then I remember being at an event the broadside mm. dinner. There were people there who had very strong opinions about what was happening and why the media was reporting on it. And a few commentators were saying to me, oh, well, you know, it's like an Aussie rite of passage, basically. We do this for every wave of migration. The Greeks, the Italians, they've all copped it. The Vietnamese, it's now the Africans' turn. And people would say it to me in a way that was very dismissive of my contribution. And when I had that conversation, I was like, this is dumb. Like, and also I was like, there's, there's an element of anti-blackness here. Like, and, and why aren't we talking about this? And I just sort of thought there has to be a place of thinking and how do we talk about this in a way that gets people to realise that people of African descent have been here for a while. And if you want to talk about our place within the contemporary sense, that has to be considered. And that if you are going to sort of start talking about it in the way that the media have reported on it, that is very racist because people don't commit crime because of the colour of their skin. A lot of factors contribute to that in any community, but most of the time it's failures in government policy. So this thing happens and I, I return home and I, and I knew because I'd done a story when I was working at SBS as a journalist about a South African convict, uh, David Stearman. So I knew that there was a convict in colonial history. But then I just sort of thought, if I can find evidence of people in the first fleet, because I'd heard about it and then I'd gone to an exhibition and seen a label, then maybe, just maybe, we can stop talking about this and then start thinking about, well, if people of African descent have been here at the same time as white people, what does that then mean? The book shifts very gracefully between the kind of bigger picture of the early colonial project and the various factors that led to it, the various implements of British Empire that mm -hmm. uh, ran through it all. And so it tells that story on the one hand, and then it also tells these individual stories of these figures who are part of it. And one of the tensions that's apparent from very early on is by placing these black convicts in that story, where we've forgotten to include them for so long or they've been willfully uh, kept out of it for so long. One of the things that happens there is their involvement or complicity in the dispossession that was the early colonial mm. project. Mm. You know, that mm. this is not a story about goodies and baddies. This mm. is not a story about, you know, the righteous or the, the damned. It's a story about what happens in a colonial context when people are trying to make a life for themselves, sometimes at the expense of one another. Mm. How tricky was that part of telling the story? probably the hardest chapter for me, I would say, writing about encounters that these black comics had with First Peoples. But it also did a wonderful thing, which is it reminded me that history is not the place that you go to be comforted. <laughs> or absolved. Oh, yeah. And I think because we are so used to these narratives that centre 
figures, individuals in history that have done remarkable things. And we look to them as kind of like, I want to be like this person or whatever. And and the problem with that flawed kind of obsession that we have with that sort of narrative is that it dismisses the fact that humans by our nature are incredibly flawed and incredibly complex. And that on the one hand, you can do something incredibly remarkable, but also make decisions that centuries down the line people look at and question. There's a story that I tell of this black comedy from Barbados, Robert James, and how he is involved in one of the biggest legal cases at the time during the period of slavery. And the interesting thing with him was that he was effectively found guilty and what should have happened, because this is just what happened during slavery, was he should have been executed. But at the time there was this governor who was sort of like a temp, <laughs> I can put it that way, and if you were governor, you, you were also head of the judicial system in a lot of these British colonies. And so he reviewed the case and he feels like there's been a miscarriage of justice. He doesn't pardon Robert James, but he does send the case to London for review because he's kind of going, I really don't think this guy got a fair trial. And that puts him in the shit because all of the white people on the island are going, what are you doing? This guy should have been like executed. Like, what are you doing? And so he puts his own life in jeopardy, but yet he firmly believes that there is a rule of law here and I'm adhering to what is required of me in this capacity. But at the same time, this acting governor, he was also a slave owner. It wasn't like he was going to invite Robert James over to his house for a cup of tea, right? And both these things can be true. And I think how that helps me in thinking about, even in the contemporary sense, particularly when we get obsessed with a binary way of thinking and looking at people and essentially expecting morally perfect humans, particularly when people do things that we don't like and we're very quick to put them in the bin. It's not to say that we shouldn't critique and challenge, but I do think that history does show us that there is so much complexity in how humans show up in the world and it's neither right or wrong. It is just a very complicated experience. But it does lead in the book, and one of the great strengths of the book is it leads to that, you know, you have the big questions, but to address them sufficiently requires very deliberate, narrow decisions, right down to the level of individual words. Uh, It's really interesting to me that you very consciously, when talking about slavery, resist using slave as a noun, but instead talk about it adjectivally, yeah. you know, enslaved people yeah, yeah. rather than slave. And that, that the deliberateness of that in this book I really appreciate and and respect hugely. I think it's it, terrific. Can you talk about decisions like that that you made? So when I first started, like like you said, I, I went in looking for a couple of individuals and then decided to unspool. They just started to show up in the, in the hundreds. And it was like being at a gravesite, really. It's just all of these names of all these dead people. And then they all moved into my house at the same time. Sounds weird, but they all did. And so I could feel their energy. And I was like, these were people, living, breathing people in all of their complexity. And what does it mean to be in a system that subjugates you, your children, your future children, their children? And what does it mean to exist? What does it mean to resist And I'm like, well, these people, yes, they were enslaved. This is what the system was doing to them. But they weren't slaves. That wasn't how they would have occupied intimate spaces, right? Within their family, they would have been mother, child, whatever that dynamic was. But what the system was doing to them was what was defining their experience, right? But then again, it goes back to how these narratives we have taken on, particularly around slavery... And that the experience of slavery was very different in many ways to what we are traditionally used to. But also that as slavery evolved and the mechanisms around that, people were afforded certain freedoms within that system, which also then complicates the whole how we think about slavery, right? People could grow their own vegetables. People could gather. But there were certain things that they could do and they were using those things to resist And that's why for me it's so important to remember that, yes, the experience was absolutely 
horrendous and one of the worst crimes against humanity in modern history. But I am sure that even in those moments, people found ways to experience joy, whatever that would have looked like within that context. And I think remembering that and remembering that it would have looked very specific to that context is very important in centering their humanity. It's incredibly moving. At the end of the book is a table where you list the names. Mm. And in fact, the design of the book, which is gorgeous, Mm. has the names across the cover. Mm. The centering of the human beings seems to be at the heart of this historical project. Absolutely. There's probably two versions of the book that I started off with. And then there was a moment in 2020, particularly with Black Lives Matter happening, that forced me to zoom out and sort of think about empire, think about all of the inheritance. And during that process, I remember sort of thinking, whenever we think about not just who gets to write history, even when we think about historical actors that have something to tell us about history, they generally aren't people from the margins, right? And what I wanted to do was to centre these people and sort of go, they have something to teach us about empire, about how this continent got to be colonised. My former research supervisor at Melbourne, Zoe Laidlaw, she did this project where she found that something like two-thirds of pre-Federation governors in Australia were essentially governors that were working in slave colonies and former slave colonies. So you've got these colonial figures who are coming here to effectively govern who are being shaped by everything else that's going on where they are. So, of course, you're going to have this stuff happening here as well. And that was very important for me because I was like, we have to be thinking about how all of that has then led to where we find ourselves in contemporary sense. Even with when we think about the displacement, the genocide, dispossession of First Peoples, the British were doing that in other territories before they finally got here. And thinking about those actions and thinking about how that treatment, the fact that by the time that Australia was being colonised, slavery was at least 150 years in, and they had refined that system of labour exploitation and they'd refined the ways in which they could control people for profit. And that started to show up, whether it was in the convict system, whether it was systems of slavery, whether it was in soldiers that were being used as labour to protect colonial interests, later on in indentured servants as well. I mean, you had all these people that were being moved around to serve empire And the way that you controlled them was to subjugate them to various degrees. And I just sort of thought it was very important that we thought about that. Because once we think about that, it helps us make sense of where we now find ourselves in the contemporary sense. Because the other end point of that subjugation, or not end point, but the the other injustice lies in the way the story gets told and what gets remembered. Absolutely. So it's, while you're addressing the core of your subject matter, actually it's the telling of that subject over generations that cements certain ideas, that limits and constrains certain players that is perhaps the most acute thing that you're redressing in this work. And with that in mind, tell me about epistemic injustice. Oh. I had such a big conversation about this with Ben, my publisher, because I was like, there's there's no way around this, Ben. I, I, I have to just use this language because it's very academic-y language. But when I, when I came across this framework, I was like, oh, my gosh, it makes sense. This philosopher, Miranda Fricker, came up with this concept of epistemic injustice, which is essentially it makes an argument that because of all of the social and political factors, they contribute to who we believe and who we don't believe. And these things tend to mirror social and political things. So, like, for example, if if you're a black person who calls the police uh, to report a crime, the likelihood of you being believed is not very, like, high, right? Versus a white person who might automatically be believed by the police. And so the epistemic justice kind of framework allows us to sort of understand who is considered an authority in something and why are they being believed. And, you know, gender plays a part in that, race plays a part in that, all sorts of things. And this then becomes the thing that starts to determine knowledge and who gets to be seen as an authority on knowledge, but also whose story gets centred. And when I realised this, it made a lot of sense because I was like, yes, part of the reason why we don't know about a lot of these black comics is racism, yes, but 
what is a thing? Because what I found was that over the years, people have written about them. And like, you know, Marcus Clarke wrote about one of the black comics, David Stearman, in the 19th century. But he's there, but he's not there in the story. As in, he's writing about David Stearman, but actually the whole point of the story is to talk about British humanitarianism and how wonderful Governor Burke is, right? So the story's about him. So you get a sense of, like, he's there, but he's not quite there. And that was what I wanted to get to, to get people to understand that sometimes you can talk about people, but you're still erasing them. And it's a thing that continues to show up in the contemporary sense as well. And I, and I, this is very pessimistic, but I still think that even though I've written this book, I still think that these histories will continue to be erased. But what I am excited about, I will say, is just how people choose to respond to these histories. I'm excited to see how in galleries and museums, labels are updated to reflect a lot of this stuff that is now going to be fact, like the fact that people will now say it from a place of like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is something we already know. Like, it, there's this context. And that they can position Australia within broader conversations around this sort of stuff. So that when you're thinking about it, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, there are these connections even within our own history. Santilla Chingape's new book, Black Convicts, is out now. Thank you so much for listening to another special episode of Read This. Join us each Sunday to hear our favourite interviews from the show. Listen out for upcoming conversations with John Safran, Claire Wright and our very own Rick Morton. And if you don't want to wait until next Sunday to dive into Read This, you can search for it wherever you listen to podcasts. There are more than 60 episodes in the archive for you to enjoy.